Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us again at the 2024 Sloan Sport Analytics Conference. My name is Mathieu Perrin, and I am a Master of Science in Management Studies student at MIT Sloan. It is my pleasure to introduce our panel, Beyond the Pitch, Transforming Soccer Through Advanced Analytics. Our panelists today are Jesse March, European soccer coach, Jan Gran, founder of Ludomatics, Sarah Rood, co-founder and CTO at Source Football, Laurie Shaw, director of football data at City Football Group, and our panel will be moderated by Ryan Hohanlon from ESPN. The panel will run for 45 minutes and will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit questions via our Cadence app. You can navigate to this panel via the schedule pane in the menu and navigate to Beyond the Pitch, Transforming Soccer Through Advanced Analytics Event. Questions can be submitted in that event and then will be selected by the moderator. With that, I turn it over to you, Ryan. Uh, first off, wanted to thank everyone for showing up at 8.30. I know it's quite early for Saturday. The conference, I think we kind of talk all the time about what is the moment where soccer will have officially made it in America. And I think when we don't have the 8.30 slot at Sloan, that's when it actually happens. <laughs> so, all right, to get the conversation started, we're at Sloan. Ian, you were here first Sloan conference, right? Not the first Sloan conference, but 2011 was the first, first soccer. soccer panel. Yeah, so soccer. since 2011, we've been doing soccer data. We have brilliant PhDs on stage. We have Jesse, a very analytics fluent coach. You have me, who writes using analytics for ESPN. Um, there's publicly available stats. You can find XG, whatever you want, um, online to make whatever arguments you want. So from the outside, it certainly looks like for lack of a better phrase, the nerds have won. And soccer is being <laughs> driven by data usage at all levels. So I'll start with you, Ian. Is that a correct statement? Uh, some of the nerds have won. So everything you say is uh, correct. We've got advanced analytics in, in soccer, have done for a long time. <clears throat> But the, uh, there is a bottleneck, which is why I say only some nerds have won. And the bottleneck is translating that analytics insight onto the pitch. And so the nerds that have won are Liverpool, because we used data to recruit players um, and were rather successful at it. The other nerds that have won are Brighton and Hove Albion and Brentford FC, and they, they are owned by professional gamblers who insist that the clubs uh, run with a data-driven philosophy. If you look at the fundamentals of Brentford, they should not be a Premier League club. Their revenue's too small, their stadium's too small, their own fans say that they're a bus stop in Hounslow. They are making a fool of the rest of the Premier League by being in the Premier League, and they've done it through using data for recruitment. Um, they're in the Premier League because the 17 other clubs don't really use data for recruitment effectively. And that's the same across Europe. Uh, MLS is probably one of the most advanced analytics leagues, but it's the same across the world. So the news have started to win, but there's, uh, there's a long way to go. Sarah, when, we, when I talked to you for my book, Net Gains Inside the Beautiful Games Analytics Revolution, go buy it. Sorry, I have to plug the book at all costs. Um, you phrased it somewhat as the development of the data and sort of what we've learned about soccer in an objective sense is on a scale of one to 10 is like a seven, let's say, while the actual application is like a two. Does that still hold true? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it is changing. Um, so like one of the interesting things I've been reflecting on is some of the new sporting director appointments that have happened in the last couple of months. Um, so last year on this panel was a guy named Mladen Sarmaz. Uh, he was recently appointed sporting director of Barnsley. So, you know, they're a league one club right now, but they're a team that I would definitely keep an eye on and see if that application goes from a two to a seven. Um, you know, I came to this conference for the first time in 2010, I think or in 2012, uh, met a gentleman named Ben Knapper, uh, worked with him at Arsenal. He's now sporting director of Norwich City. So that's another interesting club to keep an eye on. But until there are appointments like that, 
you're going to only have you know a number of of clubs like your Liverpools, Brightons, Brentfords that are really nailing both sides of data plus application. Yeah. I promise I'm not going to keep citing stories from my book. This will be the last one. <laughs> you, Jesse, told me. Um, I don't know, like 15 years ago, someone brought up the idea of data analysis in soccer, and you were like, no, like too dynamic, way too hard to measure. And then you were like, that was one of the stupidest things I've ever said, which was a great story for a book. And now that you're, you've managed in MLS, Austria, Germany, the Premier League, is it surprising to you how little it seems that these sort of pretty powerful tools are being used despite what Ian pointed out where the teams that are using it are like doing quite well. Yeah, I think probably the reason why is because people at the top of the food chain, coaches, sport directors, chairmen, owners, aren't always as comfortable with using data and analyzing how to use statistics and numbers. And so because they're not as comfortable with it, then they, they don't value it quite as much. Now, Every club I've ever been to and spoken to in the last 10 years always talks about how important data is in their analysis, but the actual application, uh, I think, falls short. Um, and obviously, there's so many ways to use it, but in the end, you need, you need to have decision makers that are in important positions in clubs that, that value it, like some of the clubs you mentioned. I mean, they're not the only examples. There's obviously examples all over the place. Um, but how to use it to, to make you better, how to tell a story for what you're trying to create, how to digest data and information in a way so that people that maybe aren't as good at, at looking at the numbers understand why they're important and how to make decisions based on what you're finding. You know, and it's not the only metric. There's obviously so many uh, things that you can value in terms of how you build a team and how you build a club, but certainly I think people that aren't using it appropriately are going to fall, are falling behind and will continue to fall behind. Yeah. So Lori, I feel like you, compared to the other three, you've been working like inside of soccer, football for a shorter period of time. You were in academia before then. What has the transition been like and what has kind of surprised you the most about like <laughs> how this stuff is being used, I guess? Yeah. So. Um before I joined City Football Group, I was fortunate enough to be able to do research with you know, sports, sports data. And, and I, th I suppose the thing about research is that you're trying to do something new and cool and you know, come to conferences like Sloan and, and present that work. The difference when you're in a club is that the sort of the incentive or the motivation is to influence decisions. And that's you know, it's quite a different thing. Um, sometimes you need to, you know, you can do something really simple to help inform those decisions or you want to take work that people have done already and you know that that's, you know, that's going to be really helpful. And the other thing is that those decisions come at you really fast. Um, the work that you do, like in research, you can do a project and it kind of only needs to work once and you can present those, those results and, and that's great. Inside a club, or I mean, I suppose this is true in any industry, it has to work every single time. And, and as people start to use it and become reliant on it, you know, they expect it to work. And so there's a lot more, a lot more to it than just sort of developing the models. You have to think about making sure that it's there and people can, people can use it all the time. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so we have a coach on stage. With doing this stuff, doing analytics, finding insights with data, how much of the sort of bottleneck can come between the insights you find and then the decision that the coach makes? How important is the relationship between the data people, the front office people, and the coach to making things happen? And your guys' experience, whoever wants to take that, maybe one of the data people before our coach. Uh, I can. I can. Make a stab at uh, why do you hate that? coaches? <laughs> why do I hate coaches? <laughs> Let me count the ways. Um, so it depends. Is the coach a bottleneck? It depends on what you think is important regarding analytics. So you can use you can use data to help a club in a number of ways. You can use it to try and help sports science and medicine. You can use it in recruitment. You can use it to try and produce more 
players from the academy or whatever. If you look at the bottom line, which is money, recruitment is the place to spend uh, your time because 65% of Premier League's revenue goes on player salaries, 25% on player transfers. So if you want to make any sort of financial impact, overperform your financial um, revenue, you have to do it through recruitment. And the coach doesn't need to be directly involved in recruitment. The coach needs to be directly involved in recruitment to say, yes, I'm comfortable with this player. I think he's a skilled player. I've got a place that he fits in my team. You absolutely need to be bought into that player. But in terms of identifying from the thousands of potential players we might sign to the five that we're seriously considering to the one that we do sign, we'll show the coach the five players that have shone in the analytics, shone in the scouting work. So the coach's job is to be comfortable and confident that the, pro the analytics process has identified the best players for the job. Um, and in that way, the coach is not a bottleneck. If you want to make a difference on the pitch by saying, hey, coach, we should uh, be more efficient in our counter attacks, or your attacking set pieces aren't efficient enough, you need to consider this option instead. That's a very difficult thing. The bar is high for an analyst to say, you're doing this wrong, coach. And the coach is a, is a bottleneck, but probably correctly a bottleneck in that situation, because you know things about the players that I can't see in the data. Jesse, is it hard? I mean, I imagine um, working for the Red Bull clubs, this sort of um, player recruitment is you know, a, a company-wide effort, right? Where I would imagine the coach has less say in who's getting recruited to Salzburg or Leipzig than probably they do at most other clubs. As a coach, is it hard to, because when I think of it, it's um, you're spending all your time coaching and training, right? Like there's just no way you can scout the entire globe. So like the benefit of having data people is they can do that. They have these tools that can whittle things down based on filters, then they can come up with you know, a list of players is it hard as a coach to kind of be like putting your faith into these people that are, you know, you don't work with on a daily basis and them suggesting players to you and then you having to use those players, knowing that like the average managerial tenure is like two yeah. years long, basically? <laughs> yes. Um, well, one of the things that I never liked about how the English media and people in England talk about teams and recruitment is they always say it's the manager's player, right? And, and listen, it was hard for me to argue this in Leeds because we were getting Americans and, and Red Bull players. <laughs> but I think that the role of the coach is to be part of a team, yeah. right? And, and you're right, we're, the, the hardest part is we're often the most expendable part of the team. But I think that you know, trying to have relationships and trust and use the resources that you have within your club to make the best decisions possible for the club and for your team, I think is really important for the overall success of what you're trying to create. Um, now, obviously, you, you, you always hope that, you know, when you say the bottleneck, like, you need a bottleneck a little bit to, to now sort through information so that when it comes to you, it's efficient and it's clean, and then you can make decisions, not just on players, but on, on almost anything that you're trying to do with, with, with uh, having success with your group. Um, and certainly, I think, um, you, with the input that you have, you also want to understand what's behind some of the decisions that are how you're being presented information, how you're being presented players, what's the decision process and how does it all fit together. And, and the longer you work with people, the more you're able to have this kind of dialogue and then create more trust that helps you make uh, efficient decision making. Because that's ultimately what you're doing, is you're trying to be as efficient as possible with every dollar that you spend. And the more that you can do that, the more I think you can help dictate success. So. I happen, you know, and you've said, you've said the reason why you've asked me to be on this panel is because I value data and I value the information that can come from numbers. Um, but always trying to, again, like I think you'll hear me say this a few times. It's, for me, it's about what's the story? Like how do you digest the information and then how do you tell a story that's ultimately effective in, in, in decision making? So I think like as you pointed out, Ian, in an ideal world, well, maybe not an ideal world, 
but not every team can be owned by a professional sports better. Not every team can be owned by FSG, Fenway Sports Group, that gave you guys a pretty like wide remit to use data. So like the reality is most other clubs in Europe, it's the the culture, the top-down culture of using data, trusting it is not there. But you still have to exist within that, right? So for you guys, Lori or Sarah, like how I mean, Tyler uh, talked about this yesterday in his talk, but how, how difficult is it and how do you better communicate and how do you pick what things to try to communicate to a coach or a decision maker somewhere else within the club? Yeah, I, can, I can talk a little bit about my experience at Arsenal. I mean, I was there for close to a decade. Things really changed because originally we had like a very centralized model of a manager who kind of oversaw all decisions on the sporting side, you know, down to medical, groundskeeping, like everything. Um, and then when he left, there was quite a shift in the dynamic of, of how we did things. So there had kind of been a way of operating where he was familiar with the data. He also took, you know, a, a number of pieces of information from different people, consumed all of that, made his decision a little bit in isolation where we didn't really know like how much he was waiting things, but um, you know that was the process. And so when he left and things started changing, we had to ad adapt to that process. And this sort of you know a little bit before I was leaving, um, and kind of where they are now is that Arsenal has really overhauled that decision making process where there is now a sporting director in place. It's you know not the same profile that you would see in American sports where it's like a Ivy League uh, consultancy background, something like that. You know, he's he played for the club. He's an invincible, um, you know, quite an imposing figure in the in the training ground. Um, but one of the things I think he did that was really clever is uh, a lot of the performance analysts that had been using data their whole careers are now heavily involved in recruitment. And so these are people that have been trained to subjectively analyze video, subjectively analyze players also really deeply involved in data and rely on that as part of their process for doing that analysis. And so that's really changed how decisions are made. Um, so I think you know that's one way of kind of transitioning from traditional model to something a little bit more progressive. I mean, clubs outside of the three that we've kind of mentioned are on this spectrum of like how well they're using data. I think you know Arsenal is probably closer to the Liverpool, Brentford, Brighton than they are. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm not going to name names, but we know <laughs> who they are. And I mean, it's working out quite well. Yeah. But as we're talking about, it doesn't seem like people are picking up on the fact that it's working quite well. I think, I mean, to kind of pick up from where Jesse and Sarah left off, if you take a step back from it all and think, how is an analytics department meant to fit into a sporting organization? What you begin to see is that where it doesn't work, it's not because they hired in bad data scientists or data engineers. It's because someone didn't really think about how, how is this meant to fit in? Like, how, what is the process for making decisions? Do we even have a process for making decisions, or is it kind of ad, ad hoc? And then, and then once you sort of thought about, OK, so this is the pro when we're going to recruit a player, this is like how information is going to be collected together, do we have someone that can take information from really different sources, so from data, you know, from, from what the scouts see, from coaching, sports, science, medical, <clears throat> the financial side as well, and, and, and kind of combine all that really different information to come to a decision. And like the very first time I came to this conference was in 2017, and, and like, you know, the keynote speaker was, was President Obama, and he, he kind of literally said this. It's like, when I was president, and I had a big decision to make. You know, I'd get all, all these people with like very different viewpoints, and their information. You can just add up their information necessarily and come out to like the net best decision. You have to kind of consider lots of really different things, and and it's having someone at the club that can do that, that is capable of of taking information from very different sources, and coming to a decision, is ultimately one of the things that really drives the success of this endeavor. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, it's interesting. I think, I think you, you and I were talking yesterday about how a lot of clubs get into this situation where they hire a coach, the coach signs like three players that fit this coach's style, then he inevitably gets fired because everyone gets fired. And then the new coach comes in and 
they sign like four players that fit his style, and then he gets fired, and then the new coach comes in and he signs three people, and then you have this like Frankenstein's monster of a team of players that like, these guys can counterattack, these ones can play possession, these ones can press high. Does, it seems like that can, that doesn't just potentially affect the playing staff, that can affect sort of how the whole club runs as a whole. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even competitive advantage through data. It's just like actual sensible decision making. Where's the long term planning? Like we just said, that yeah. managers have an average of a two year tenure in the Premier League. Players are signed typically on four or five year contracts. So when you sign a player, that player is probably going to outlast the manager. So you need to think about, you know, what's, you know, is this player going to be suitable for the next manager? And, and to do that, you need to have a consistent, style of play so that you can think of, you know, this is the way we want to play. We're going to hire a manager that would, that is, is going to play this way. And if that manager has to leave for whatever reason, we're going to find someone else that can use that same set of players and we'll have continuity. And, you know, that doesn't even necessarily, that doesn't require data initially. It just requires long-term planning. Yeah. That's why I think the uh, Red Bull system is really interesting. You will be able to speak better than me about it, but the continuity of style um, and the fact that those Red Bull coaches have gone on to have great careers elsewhere, you know, maybe this is a really good style for coaches yeah. to have. And also, it's no surprise that Liverpool kept on going back to Red Bull clubs <laughs> for players, because guess what? Klopp's style is pretty similar to Red Bull's style. But that um, Frankenstein's monster that you end up with, that's not the coach's fault. It's not the recruitment or analytics fault. It's an ownership problem of no long-term planning. There is a thing called style, you can measure it, you can find a coach that plays in, this, in the same style. So the problem comes from the top, absolutely. Yeah. But even Jesse, I feel like, uh, if you're willing to speak about this, I feel like even as you, I guess you're probably the only coach, right, who's coached at New York, Salzburg, and Leipzig, mm -hmm. correct? But I think even when you came into Leipzig, despite the organizational continuity, they actually had started to play slightly differently mm -hmm. under their previous coach, under Nagelsmann, yep. um, which I think probably made it hard for you to come in because it wasn't the standard Red Bull style. Not st I shouldn't say standard, but the general Red Bull style, they weren't playing that. And then you come in, and can you speak about the difficulty of having to try to convince the players, I guess for lack of a better term, to run <laughs> more often, <laughs> yeah. basically? No, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, when I first joined Red Bull, this was one of the things that I, I loved, was that the, 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 the machine and the cogs in the machine all seemed to just fit well. And, and everybody understood the, the identity and the roles that they had in committing to the identity. And, you know, there's plenty of stories. Like, there's a story that um, when someone went to NASA in the 70s and they asked a janitor, what are you doing here? They said, We're, I'm trying to put a man on the moon. Right? And so, or 60s maybe this was, okay, maybe my dad, my, my dates are off. But the point is, like, it's really pretty simple. It's not complicated. Like, the more that there's a real understanding as to what the identity is, what the, the, the DNA of, of what you're trying to create, and I don't care if it's football or, or whatever you're doing, like, if everybody understands how they fit and what direction you're going in and what the ultimate goal is, then it's obviously easier for people to, to commit to doing their jobs effectively. Um, you know, how, how all these things fit together, yeah, that's complex. You know, like, I, one of the, when, when I first went to Leipzig, we had gotten a player, and, and they advertised it as the first player that, that they discovered from data, okay? And he didn't, it didn't really work out. And there was multiple reasons why it didn't work out, but it was really funny to hear people, like, inside the organization, like, coaching type people go, well, look, you know, this doesn't work. You ha there's so much more to how to identify a player than just data. And of course that's true. You know, so how, how all these things fit, how people are willing to accept ideas that maybe challenge the way they think. So for a, an example for me is, I, I've started working with an AI company and to build kind of my own playing style. And, and what I've found is that there's certain data that has reinforced some of the tactical ideas and philosophies that I have and concepts about how I think the game should be played. And then there's other data that has challenged certain things that we do. And, and so 
it's forced me and my staff to really now analyze, all right, how do we move forward from here and how do we maximize within the things that we're trying to achieve with our identity, how do we maximize what we're, our tactical concepts and, and strategies so that we're maximizing potential, right? And so there are some things that you can go, all right, that's an easy one, it fits like this. And then there are other ones that are more complex and they require more thought and, and analysis as to how to use that information correctly to help benefit you and not complicate. So at the end of it, it's about efficiency and simplicity and how it all fits together so that everybody can do their job most effectively. Yeah, I, I mean, we've talked a little bit about um, how, do, how you communicate with people. And Ian, I know I brought up the idea of like communicating data to players and you almost like threw up on our <laughs> call. <laughs> like hearing a coach talk about his AI model, like would you prefer your ideas to be presented to a manager like without using the data basically? Knowing the data pre like came up with these insights, I guess I have to use that word on a Sloan panel, otherwise I'd be failing. Um, like, what is the ideal communication model like for you um, from a data scientist, researcher, to a coach? Do you want a coach looking at data? Do you want to give him like a ream of things to look at tackles and all this stuff? Or do you want some kind of more tailored thing? Having a coach who's data curious is great, and it's new, new in soccer. Um, but data is a bit like dynamite. It can be really powerful, but it can blow up in your face. And in soccer, more than in any other sport, raw statistics are misleading or meaningless. And so you have to apply a lot of context to those raw numbers. And that's where the translation and communication becomes difficult to say, coach, we can't just look at the sprinting distance. We have to look at game state. Uh, opposition, physical uh, intensity as well, and so on. And it, it just naturally becomes more difficult to interpret data that is adjusted rather than data that is raw. So at Liverpool, we didn't, we didn't need to involve Jürgen in the data process. The history of civilization is specialization. People have specialized roles that allows them to become super experts in their role. And uh, Jürgen is an expert coach. Um, very sort of emotion, emotionally driven, which you need to be if you're a coach, I, I feel. And so um, the data was used to produce some stories and some insights for Jürgen. It was all there for him to analyze and go through in detail, uh, no secrets at the club. Um, but the amount of time that it would take to go through that education process, the coach has got two games a week to prepare for, you've literally got more important things to do than understand my machine learning model. If you want to understand my machine learning model, brilliant, I'll happily tell you about it. But um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not important. What's important is the trust, the, the stories and insights that come to the coach. The coach trusts that they are um, good insights, and that comes through experience. It also comes from the other decision makers at the club, like the sporting director, for example, saying we have complete trust in this process. When we say this player is not performing in this area of his game, then then we trust it. You have to address it as a coach. Yeah, I, I would just add something to that. Like, we're kind of at, at a point in the evolution of the the industry where people know enough to be dangerous. Uh, people can get their hands on data and information that's kind of like outside of what's being curated within the club. And so you have to, I think, go through that education process with a lot of people. Like a really good example is scouts. Like they're gonna be going on the internet and finding information that kind of like supports the narrative. And so you have to kind of go through that education process with them and kind of say like, hey, like you shouldn't be looking at that type of number or we have this other metric here that kind of might provide a little bit more context into what's going on there. So, you know, at, at Arsenal, we kind of had, a, I think, a similar model to Liverpool where we didn't directly try to provide raw stats and information to the coaching staff. Instead, we kind of liaised with the performance analysis staff, packaged everything together into a story with video. Um, but when we wanted to roll it out to the academy, that didn't really scale. 
Um, so we had to go through quite an intense education process with them. And so then you had, you know, throughout multiple age groups, this kind of like triad of a little bit of data support, most of it self-service, really well-educated performance analyst working with the coaching staff of that age group, and then getting the players to kind of look at their own data and be introspective about like, where am I on my individual development plan? What am I improving? How do I feel about that from you know, what I'm seeing on the pitch versus what the, the data is saying? And I think that worked really, really well. So one of the things I think gets underplayed in soccer in general is just like the uncertainty of every decision. No signing is 100% to work out. You look at the success rates of signings, there's almost no correlation between transfer fees and success. Um, and yet, I, do, I don't think that that's appreciated enough. And you guys, as data people, like you work in uncertainty. Nothing, none of your insights, I'm sorry that I keep using that word, um, are like 100%, right? And so how do you, at the same time, you want the people at the club to listen to what you're saying, right? So like when you, I don't know, uh, like, Laura, you say you just, for an example, like you identify a player and you have an idea that he's gonna be a success, but like you know that whatever you've found, like you, you can't be 100% sure, or some other insight in how to play or some focus on some area where you have like 70% confidence. But you can't like, are you, are you, are you gonna tell a coach like, I'm, I'm like 70% sure this will work? You can't, right? So like how do, how do you balance the like, academic rigor of what you're doing with trying to get people to listen to you? Yeah, I mean, this is really tough. Um, typically, like football conversations are with people that have really strong opinions, and very few people in the room are gonna say, you know, I'm 70% sure this is gonna work. They're gonna be, this is gonna work, or this is not gonna work. And then, you know, as you're building, if you're working with data, you know, as all, as all, as all, good statisticians, physicists, and so on, know like you, you might measure a number which you think is important, but that number also comes with uh, an uncertainty. And that uncertainty might be driven by how much data you have. Um, and it might be driven by you know, what you think your model captures and what it doesn't capture. And, and to be honest, it can be that you know, I just built this model. <laughs> like I, haven't, you know, I would like to have two years to go and test it historically and, and to monitor things and get real confidence in it myself. But you don't, you're not afforded that time. So how do you go into a conversation and, and, and sort of say you're expected to basically tell the story of the data and people, ultimately someone wants to know, they want to be able to make a decision and they want to know like, what are you recommending? And so you, might, you have, might have a list of players and it might be that the actual difference in whatever metric you have is, is not big between the top player on that list and the bottom player on that list, if it's a fairly short list. And um, you know, once you consider the statistical uncertainties, and it's, I don't think this, there's like a hard and fast rule you can play here. It's, it's you've got to try not to use technical language. Um, try to be honest with what you have. And, and to be honest, actually, I found that working in football, people have been quite receptive to the notion of uncertainty. And the people got a quite strong radar from when you're being too decisive about something that they think you should be more uncertain from. In the past, I've, I've, I've also worked in, in government and you know, doing some policy advice and sometimes working with politicians. And you know, they are, politicians were a lot harder to work with in this regard. They were like, you know, I, I don't want to know what your uncertainty is. I want to know what the number is going to be in five years' time. I can't <laughs> be uncertain when I stand up and talk to the electorate. It's good because soccer is obviously much more important than any uh, government decisions that are being made. So. Yeah, it's kind of scary to know that politicians yeah. are more stubborn than <laughs> I think my, my experience has been a little different of it's been way, way too much certainty and the only way you can combat it is by being overconfident in your recommendations because you're not going to get listened to if you say I'm 70%. So the, I had a, uh, one a, a player that, that didn't fit the style of the team the coach wanted this player above all other players. Um, my feedback was, you know, player B is actually better than player A um, for these reasons. And so the coach was challenged on this, and his response was, 
if given the choice between player A and player B, I would choose player A 1,000 times out of 1,000. So for me to go up against that with 70%, I'm not going to get my point across. And so it's, it's uh, unfortunate that you, ha you can't be fully honest about uncertainty. Things are changing. Coaches are becoming more intelligent, receptive to these sort of ideas, and I think fundamentally and intuitively understand them. But if they want their player, they're going to attach way too much certainty to the superiority of their player. Yeah. yeah. I think how much, Jesse, how much pressure as a coach does going from MLS to Europe, or let's say the Bundesliga or the Premier League, it's obviously a higher level um, of soccer, but there's no, in MLS, the, um, there's no sort of competitive kind of tiers, right? I guess there are to qualify for the CONCACAF Champions League and stuff like that, but there's no relegation. There's not like a, f a race for the top four. How much do those pressures, you know, you managed at Leipzig where the goal was to win the league, I imagine. You, you wanted to finish top four, but you probably had dreams of like p possibly knocking off Bayern. And then you come in at Leeds and it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So how does that, for you, how do you like balance this extreme urgency that's like putting all this pressure on your livelihood, basically, mm -hmm. with like knowing that long term thinking and like uns accepting uncertainty is like actually the way to succeed in the long run, but you don't, on average, you're probably not going to get that chance just based on how. Coaching. Yeah, it was a little depressing when you guys started throwing out <laughs> the numbers of how long Premier League managers and everything lasts. That's not the most fun thing to hear. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I've always tried to treat the job as if my plan is to be there long term. You know, as to, I feel like you try to make decisions that you think are best for the club. And the part that you talk about is, depending on where you are, the expectations and demands are a little bit different. And so I think you always have to have a sense as to what you're trying to achieve from an idealistic standpoint, but then also be pragmatic enough to understand based on the scenarios that you're, that you're dealing with, how do you maximize potential of what you're getting out of your team every day? And, and that's really what it's about. And so, um, you know, the challenges of coaching each team that I coach were different based on what the makeup of the team was, where, what country I was coaching in, what the standards of excellence were, what the challenges were. Um, um, and, and then in there, like how everything from how do you find players, how do you interact with your academy, what's your staff like, what's your medical team like, what, I mean, there's so many hats that you have to wear. And it's, it's an, even when sometimes when I just think about it now that I'm on the outside and I think about the daily process of all the things you have to do, it's a little bit overwhelming even to think about it. But when you're in the middle of it, again, it's about simplifying the process and trying to help everybody understand what their roles are and how they fit within the bigger ecosystem. And so, and I think that your ability to do that and then also understand the prior, prioritizing what is most important for your team to get success on the weekend, but then also in a month and in six months and in a year and have a vision for how to put, put that to practice every day often dictates your, your ability to have success. So, um, and you know, the other part with me is I try to be very open. So whether it's with decision makers or with the players that I coach or my staff or fans even at times or media, like I try to be, you know, to have real conversations that are going to help us understand how to do our job most effectively. And, and sometimes that requires uncomfortable conversations. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's speaking with you guys and, and having a differ of opinion of how you think the process should be put in place and what we see and how, how it all fits together. But always I try to be um, adaptable and listen and, and help and trust people around me to, to be good at what they're good at and help me be good at what I'm good at. Yeah. So I think that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, in the Somewhere end, it, it's, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big task, yeah. right? You're, you're, and obviously the, the, the bigger the league and the bigger the competitions and everything, the, the attention and scrutiny and attention to detail becomes, becomes, you know, bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> so I feel like we've been not negative, but we're just sort of painting a picture of there's all this, these good ideas out there that have been shown to work 
and they're just still not really being used. So let's try to finish on, like, where, what is the, Sarah, what would you say if you're working, obviously you're at a club, you're sort of at the whims of what um, is demanded of you, I guess, asked of you by a coach, someone like that on a day-to-day -day basis, but like, what is the area where this sort of work can have the biggest like immediate impact? Is it recruiting? Is it s convincing coaches to focus on set pieces? Is it like larger strategy? What's the... Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at kind of like each of the areas where there's touch points with data and ident identify some low-hanging fruit. So I think set pieces, like the amount of time managers still spend training set pieces is far below, I think, what every data department is going to ask for. Um, it just feels like that's like an obvious win. Um, but, you know, my philosophy has always been get the right players into the building, um, keep them healthy, keep them on the pitch, and then you can talk about kind of like maximizing um, what they're actually doing on the pitch. I think in Tyler's talk, he talked about, uh, Tyler's talk yesterday, he mentioned a lot about like don't stack expertise. Um, you know, unlike I think a lot of American sports where there wasn't this kind of like antagonistic style that had to evolve. Like I think coaches in football like generally like have a really good sense of what they're doing and, and how to win. Like there aren't these really obvious tactical errors that they're making. If there were, they would get relegated, they would get fired, like they wouldn't exist. Like that wasn't happening in baseball. Um, and so there are a lot of inefficiencies in baseball because of that. So, you know, that's why I think it's probably like one of the last areas to touch because like you have a lot of people subjectively watching the games, analyzing them. Like data can help over a longer period of time, but like you don't necessarily need to look at like the last 50 matches of your opponent always. Yeah. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, being emphasized, like I think it's, you know, it really is true that you want to put as best the best eleven players as you can on the pitch, and you know, the um, so obviously recruitment is incredibly important. But then, you know, there's there's also the element of helping players, particularly young players, get to the highest possible level they can. Um, I think there's a lot there's a lot more we can do to understand. You know, you've got a 17 year old that you think is really you know, really talented, like how, what's the right trajectory for them to get to the best possible green? You know, that they're not gonna go straight into your first team. They need to play, they need to be challenged. Um, I mean, often in, in soccer, what clubs do is they, the young players, they'll at some point send them out on a kind of a loan journey. They'll loan them to a club to get experience and then maybe to sort of a, a club higher up the, the hierarchy of, of soccer to, to get some more experience. Just thinking about you know, can, are we getting the most out of, are we helping our players get to the best possible level they can get to? Um, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a big challenge, but one in which, you know, we have enough data going back long enough that we can really begin to understand how to optimize that, how to help players, ensure players are at the right place in their career at the right time, getting the, num the correct number of minutes. Ian, I imagine your answer is recruitment, 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 recruitment. <laughs> I was only going to say three times, <laughs> but um, yeah, Liverpool's recruitment was horrible before um, we arrived. John Henry understood that's where the edge was. Two years I spent exclusively working on uh, recruitment applications. The nice thing is you need to understand how other teams play and the strengths and weaknesses of players on all teams to do recruitment. So we got for free a lot of match analysis tools from the recruitment work that we did. Um, then when we got tracking data for a wide range of leagues, I hired Will Spearman, super talented data scientist, to work on tracking data for match analysis. Uh, applications because we thought great this is the time we can really start to work with the coaching staff I had a conversation with Mike Gordon from FSG and he said you know what I think this I think you should use this for recruitment and not match analysis <laughs> and you know what he was right because using tracking data really allowed us to say something about centre-back so Canate for example had to cover huge amounts of space in um, uh, Leipzig's uh, system and guess what at Liverpool he has to do the same thing and you just can't see that through event data if we'd have used 
if you'd have used that data for match analysis instead, yeah, we'd have done some useful and interesting stuff, but would we have recruited one of the best young centre backs in Europe? Probably not. Yeah. So you're the reason why he left me at Leipzig. <laughs> Sorry, Jesse. Sorry, Jesse. You got him fired. Then. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Now you guys Thanks need to lot. sort of sort this out on stage. Um, Jesse, for you, what like what is as a manager? What's the like prime use of data? Like, what helps you the most? Do you feel like is it like aiding with recruitment in this way, or are there certain insights that you get into how you play that? helps you make adjustments? How? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the two, we use it, I, I try to use it in a lot of areas, right? But I think the two that have benefited me the most are training methodologies. Um, you know, like I've, I've, the teams I've coached have run the most and have the fewest soft tissue muscle injuries. So it's pretty simple. We've developed a science for how to train athletes to keep them as fit as possible without risking them uh, uh, at injury. Um, and then I think opposition analysis, you know, uh, I think those two areas, like every match, like before the, when the, the ma last match finishes, the next morning I have a data packet on my, on my desk and then I go through and I try to decipher exactly what I think is important about what the opponent is doing and then I try to tell the story to the players as part of our match plan, here are the things we need to emphasize, here are the things we need to be good at, and this is what it's going to require for this opponent. So I'd say probably those two areas are, are the, the areas we use most often. Yeah, and I imagine as, if you're willing to trust that information, it would save you a ton of time from like watching a ton of tape or whatever, not that you don't watch tape, but it, it should make you more efficient, I would imagine. You sound like an old man when you say tape. <laughs> <laughs> I, my favorite analytic time. is the eye test. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get pulled off stage with a hook <laughs> around my neck. Um, all right, we have a little bit left. We have a couple of questions. Um, so one of them, is there a transformation in how the game is played that was driven by data analytics similar to NBA in threes and layups? Anyone want to take that? Has it changed at all? All right, how about this? What has happened is that if you look at the average distance from goal uh, that shots are taken from in the Premier League, it does inch down basically every season. You could make the argument that that's an XG, expected goals related thing. Based on everything we've just discussed, it probably isn't. So h how do you explain that maybe? There could be... Let me say one thing. So <laughs> Brentford's, part of Brentford's playing model is not shooting from outside the box. So they, they have the fewest shots in the Premier League from outside the box, and they have one of the best shot conversions or they you know, have statistics. The, they have the highest, like every season, they have the highest expected goals per shot, and then I think the lowest expected goals allowed per shot, like without fail. Some of that comes from set pieces as well, so short, very short range attempts uh, from set pieces, so a higher focus on set pieces um, would lead to that, and that's something Brentford definitely, definitely train on. Um, the, the decrease in distance is not due to analytics because most teams just don't care. I think it's a consequence of a change in playing style. So um, Pep's and Klopp's style of football, other teams um, play in a much more similar style to that compared to 10 years ago when it was long ball football and um, attempts from outside the area. So I think it's a consequence of better coaching and a better style of play in the Premier League. But I think it's just a happy accident that it looks analytics uh, uh, related. Yeah, I would say like when I first got my hands on some data, like the first question I wanted to answer was, does Arsenal really walk it in? Because that was kind of like their reputation as like, oh, instead of shooting from outside of the box, there was kind of like a open opportunity. They're really trying to do like 10 passes inside the box and then tap in on the far post. And yeah, they, they were, but so were all the other good teams in the Premier League because they were just generating higher quality shots. And so, yeah, it's probably not fair to say like this is completely driven by XG because back then there weren't XG models to really explain this. Um, but I think what's happening is like, you know, data is forcing people to be a little bit more intentional in how they analyze things. Um, so there's a big question of like, hey, if I'm going to shoot from outside of the box, like, what are the consequences of doing that? And so I think, you know, whether you're going to say that's like a data-driven response or just like, hey, I'm thinking about like 
how can I make my team better by getting shots closer to goal? I think it's probably more that than, than purely XG. Yeah. Lori, any, are there any things that you feel have changed within the sport? Is there, in it, I mean, Arsenal's been great on set pieces. I think City, you guys have improved on set pieces after seemingly not focusing on them before you got there. Is, is the set piece growth, if there even is any, on a grander scale, is that sort of analytic based or is there any, anything else either that's happening or you think that like we've learned about this sport and teams should be doing but no one's doing? Mm. I mean, it's both, I mean, I've been working professionally in it for three years. I don't have quite the same length of horizon as, as everyone else here. Um, you know, one thing that's been really apparent to me is there is a lot of thought and preparation that goes into every match. And sometimes, you know, particularly the le level of detail that you can get in looking at using data to look at opponents, not just in their last four or five games, but going back 10, 20, 50 games, you know, maybe even longer than that, if they've had the same, the same playing style and coach. And that feeds into how you can approach the game, the kind of confidence that you can do things that you might be that might appear risky or you're uncomfortable with because you're fairly confident that this is how the opponent is going to respond in a certain situation and, and therefore the players can have you know, some patterns of play that they can, they can resort to, they can use to say, well, this is what they do, so therefore we can play, 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 play in, in this situation, we can play that way. The amount of information that we understand about the opponents now is really helping dictate playing styles, I think. Mm -hmm. Ian, do you have any wacky ideas for how teams could be better with how they play beyond recruiting better players, which we know is important? Um, teamwork's kind of misunderstood, mis not misunderstood, teamwork's not really understood. That's a really interesting area. My wacky idea, because you asked me this before and I didn't have a good answer, I've been thinking about it. My wacky idea, thinking about when I used to play uh, soccer computer games, you've got different skills for different players, is what happens if we just max out one of those skills for the team? So uh, the Japanese national team, everyone kind of looks like a central midfielder. So what would happen if we had 11 Adama Traores on the pitch? What would happen if we had 11 Virgil van Dijk's on the pitch? I think that's a really wacky idea. And from a like, scientific perspective, really fun experiment to do. Jesse, who would win? A team of 11 Lionel Messi's and a team of 11 Virgil van Dijk's. Which team would you rather coach? The Messi team. For sure. <laughs> but can Messi play in goal? <laughs> you, don't, you don't need him to. Yeah, Van Dyke right. might be that. That might be more effective, but the Messi team would be a lot more fun. Yeah. Uh, is there any like things that you'd like to try to implement in how your teams play that like you haven't been able to because there's sort of players are accustomed to playing a certain way. Like, or, or if the result, next result wasn't quite so important, what would you love to try yeah. out? Like, what would you experiment I mean, with? I, I you think, could? you know, like even when I'm talking about this AI model that we're building, you know, we've looked at a lot of things like throw-ins, defensive throw-ins, attacking throw-ins, free kicks, goal kicks. Like one of the things about goal kicks is you're more, always more likely to give up a goal than you are to score a goal. So this idea, especially now as the game has evolved more into pressing, right, this is, this is transferring a little bit. So the, always, for me, the concept of, of what you're doing with the ball and what you're doing against it, what you're doing in set pieces, trying to create a, as well-rounded a team as possible, but not knowing that you only have a limited amount of time to do certain things. So I don't know if the answer, I, I think the answer would be to try, I like, I like certain things with set pieces being creative and and trying things that almost you know aren't gonna work, but at least the opponent has to think about, well, what the hell are they doing there? And, and then it's a setup for something later. And so I, I get bored a little bit if the tactics are always the same and if the set pieces are always the same and if every, you know, I, I'm inspired by creativity as well. So I don't know, I think I'd maybe try some crazier. Yeah, like it feels like Crazy not a lot kick of- plays. Yeah, like a, yeah, not a lot of like experimentation this. happens, which I think kind of is a larger theme of what we're talking about because the pressures are so day-to-day, -day, so worried about getting relegated, getting promoted, getting worried about the next game, so. If it works, you look like a genius. If it doesn't work, everyone's like, what the hell is he doing? Yeah, like, are you, you you're, yeah, you're better off 
if you fail and do the thing everyone else is doing, then it's yeah, but no one I, cares. I, you know? You'll get another job if you fail the same way as everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Jesse hopes otherwise for that as someone who tried to play a different style with a team lower down the table. But, um, well, I think that's it. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for the brilliant insight. <laughs>